Welcome to OpenBXRX on BronxNet. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, inviting you to get social with us at BronxNet TV on Instagram and Twitter and BronxNet Community Television on Facebook. Also, if you're currently watching us on cable, you can continue to stay up to date with our on-screen social media feeds, providing you the latest COVID-19 community updates and important headlines. Conditions in jails and prisons have always been a cause for concern, but especially now during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mayor Bill de Blasio's office recently announced that more than 1,500 inmates have been released from city jails. However, many advocates have been calling for Governor Andrew Cuomo to hashtag let them go and hashtag free them all to stop the spread. Joining us now to discuss prisons during COVID-19 and more is Vincent M. Sutherland, Executive Director of the NYU Laws Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law. Thank you for joining us, Vincent. Thanks for having me. So first, I want to start off with learning about your work at NYU Center for um, Race, Inequality, and the Law. Sure. So we're an interdisciplinary uh, institute that's housed at the law school and committed to confronting the laws, policies, and practices that drive racial inequality and lead to the oppression and marginalization of people of color. Um, we engage in public education, policy advocacy, litigation, um, with an eye toward raising our collective consciousness about race and inequality in America um, to try and, and restore some fairness come a legal system and combat the, the crisis of mass incarceration and to secure equity and community development and the provision of government services. We also look at the role of technology um, and try and advance racial justice um, with the use of technology that so often informs decision making in the systems that govern our lives. Um, we partner with advocates, academics, and communities to advance racial justice, really. Thank you, Vincent. And about the current COVID-19 outbreak in jails like Rikers, for instance, why are many advocating now for to free prisoners and using the hashtags let them go and free them all for this cause? Sure. So the reality is that in the absence of a global pandemic, prisons, uh, jails, immigration detention centers, ordinarily hotbeds of disease, infection, and death. I um, mean, COVID-19 really compounds on dangers by magnitudes, uh, both for the people who are locked behind their walls and for those who work in those facilities um, as well. And so becoming infected with a potentially lethal disease, um, you know, by any reasonable standard is well beyond the cost that one should pay um, when they're incarcerated. No one's been sentenced to death by COVID-19. Um, and yet that's what we're, that's what we fear is, is going to happen um, to so many who are behind prison walls. Can we talk about just the structure of a prison um, and the emphasis on the impossibility, the improbability of social distancing while in a jail or prison? Sure. So the reality is that these places, um, prisons and jails are, are designed um, really to, to keep people in close quarters, in close contact. Um, Healthcare in those facilities are, are, is often overwhelmed and inadequate. Um, people are being denied um, hand sanitizer uh, for fear that it'll be, it'll be turned into contraband. Um, uh, even the guards who are in these facilities are calling, they're working and, and they're saying that they're working kind of cesspools of illness. Um, and it's true of prisons and jails uh, nationwide. Um, the practices that, that are really required to limit the spread of coronavirus um, uh, between healthy people um, you know, physical distancing, using hand sanitizer, washing your hands, all those things are impossible in carceral settings. Um, and so what we've really seen is that the only way to kind of to try and to limit the spread of this disease and to try to limit the death and illness and sickness that's going to come from it is to release as many people as possible. Um, we've heard stories talking about their lives in prison. One gentleman uh, named John Lennon, um, who's incarcerated at Sing Sing here in New York State, um, noted he's 60 years old, he's been in prison for 30 years, um, described the physical space of the prison as one that forces close contact. Um, people were standing shoulder to shoulder with each other as they used the phone. Um, early on, they weren't allowed to cover their faces with any type, with anything, um, not masks, not uh, uh, paper towels, um, nothing at all. Um, there was there was not no clarity on who's being tested and when they're being tested. Uh, people were, were, were afraid to go on sick call and ask for, for help uh, for fear of being retaliated against or for fear of not even getting any treatment or getting the attention they deserve. Um, people are talking about their lives in Rikers, um, living in these dorm type settings that are ripe for infection. People uh, with beds three, two or three feet apart from each other, crowded and stacked on top of each other, sleeping head to toe. Um, people are afraid to go to the mess hall to eat. Um, just, just really awful conditions. Um, and, and the reality is that these places, um, whether you're talking about a prison, which is where someone's serving a sentence, um, or a jail where someone is often being held before their cases are resolved or, or they're serving, serving a very short sentence of, of less than a year, um, these are just awful, awful places that are just designed um, um, really to keep people in close quarters and makes it impossible to, to, to engage in type of social distancing or other method, methods um, to prevent uh, infection and disease. 
Right. Um, we learned about two um, gentlemen who were arrested on minor parole violations and died in Rikers as a result of COVID-19, Michael Tyson and Raymond Rivera. Can we just talk about that, how um, there are still people held in incarcerated and they have minor violations at risk of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Yeah, so the reality is that, um, you know, both of their deaths are absolute tragedies, as is any death. Um, uh, you know, anywhere, um, and my, my heart kind of breaks for their families. I think um, what the, these uh, terrible circumstances speak to is the absolute um, uh, urgency of releasing people um, from these facilities as quickly as possible. Um, but also speaks to kind of the absurdity that we have with respect to our system of never forgiving people, of never, um, uh, you know, of having these these oppressive systems entangled in people's lives um, long after they paid their debt to society. And the fact that they were there for these minor technical violations, things like failing to report to a parole officer or leaving a drug treatment program, these are not capital offenses. These are not offenses that um, uh, would require that they be re-imprisoned. Um, they certainly should not have been sentenced to, to you know, or, or excuse me, they certainly should not have been locked away um, in, in facing uh, potential death and illness. And, and here we see kind of the tragic culmination of all of these uh, uh, terrible ways about going about releasing people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I know that uh, Mayor de Blasio and others have, have tried to do their best to try and release people um, who are, are dealing with technical violations. And I think some of that work has been um, uh, useful and it's gotten people out of harm's way. Um, but the reality is that there are far more people um, still sitting in jails and prisons that we need to try and get out. On the other hand, Vincent, there's an argument of releasing people accused of convicted of crimes um, uh, resulting in more crimes. Some people are uh, afraid or worried that if, you know, people that are convicted felons are released at this time, then that would lead to more crimes. What is being proposed in regards to freeing that population? So the reality is that the people who are being released, um, who have been convicted of, of, of any offenses um, and are being released early, so to speak, um, often are not being are not able to be released unless they have stable place to go back to, um, and they're not being released to, to to shelters and other types of transitory housing. They actually have to have a residence, kind of have all the the the, um, the pieces in place in order to ensure that they're they're reentering society in at least a safe manner that's going to help them and support them as they're out um, in the world. Um, you know, a lot of the narrative around uh, people being convicted of crimes, kind of going back and, and committing more offenses, is really belied by the data. Um, we think about the the you know vast numbers of people who've been released thus far, and a handful of people have been rearrested. Um, um, it really speaks to this notion that people are just trying to stoke fear. Um, it's the same type of fear that led us to have these huge jail and prison populations in the first place, and and drove us down this direction of mass incarceration and mass criminalization, which really has undermined our safety for everyone and health for everyone. And in regards to race and inequality in the justice system outside of jails, um, some videos have surfaced of the NYPD arresting people of color for not social distancing. And on the other hand, in Brooklyn, I've seen videos of Hasidic Jews, for instance, blatantly disobeying social distancing by the hundreds. What is your take on this? So, you know, my, my, my view is that it's really unsurprising. Um, uh, communities of color, especially black and Latinx communities have always been over-policed, have always been the subject of heightened police attention. Um, and the, the the disparities that you see in treatment between uh, those communities and communities in, in Brooklyn that you mentioned are, are, I think, the same disparities you would see in communities where, where you have predominantly white neighborhoods across New York City. Um, my sense is and my view is that it's often the case that the police are, are flooding these neighborhoods, of neighborhoods of people of, of communities of color, um, and really engaging in, in police work um, uh, in this unfair and disparate way. Um, and I think it's explained largely by our country's kind of history around race and inequality and this notion that we always as associate race with criminality and dangerousness and therefore think we need to impose this, this huge police presence on these communities when the reality is that people are going about their lives and doing the things they need to do in order to survive. And just to close out, final thoughts, Vincent, on why Governor Cuomo must act now and release more prisoners and how people can join this cause. So we're facing an absolute crisis of monumental proportions if we do nothing. Um, you know, I know Governor Cuomo has, has in recent days uh, said he's going to release people who are um, at least consider people for release who are 55 and over, older, um, who, who have uh, less than 90 days left on their, on their term of incarceration um, and who have uh, been convicted of nonviolent offenses and who uh, have some, uh, some health uh, concern that would make them 
far more likely to, to uh, far more likely to uh, suffer um, death um, as a result of contracting coronavirus. The reality is, though, that we need to expand the net of people who are thinking about releasing. Um, Governor Cuomo can, can safely and should safely release thousands of people from, from prison. He has executive authority to do so, to commute sentences, to authorize good time credits, to grant medical parole, to grant clemency. Um, we know um, that if we allow this disease to spread in our prisons and in our jails, um, it's not only, not only going to cause massive suffering and death to the people who are locked in those facilities, but will also overwhelm the communities that surround those facilities, the hospitals um, and other medical uh, treatment facilities that surround those types of facilities. And if we really want to think about our health, um, the reality is that it's in interconnected to all other communities. And so we can't um, allow uh, uh, a continuing crisis in, inside prison walls um, um, and hope to be safe. Um, uh, as a society. Um, in order to get involved, I think, you know, a lot of folks are doing um, incredible work. Um, one of them, among them, is, is the RAP campaign, the Releasing People in Prison campaign. The organization has been leading this fight, along with a number of other advocates. Um, what I would suggest is going to their uh, website, uh, RAP, R-A-P-P, campaign.com. Uh, they're always uh, uh, describing kind of the actions they're taking and, and the work they're engaging in and it's work that you can very much get engaged in just from your from your own home um, you should also call the governor call your representative ask them to act uh, demand that they act um, uh, this is a crisis and we need all hands on deck to ensure that we don't um, allow the spread of, of this disease to overwhelm all of us and to cause kind of the mass death that we all fear thank you vincent for your time today thank you for joining us and giving us this information sure no problem Open BXRX, we'll be right back.